Hey, this is Dr. Corey Glenn, and I'm going to show in this video a uh, workflow to go all the way from uh, prepping a tooth for a crown all the way to designing it in Blue Sky Plan and then printing it in one of the new uh, 3D printed resins that's approved by the FDA for permanent use. And so the intraoral scanner that I'm going to be using for this demonstration is the Clearstream 3600. Uh, I've gone ahead and launched this software, and we're going to be doing a restoration. And your workflow might, might be a little different here, depending on your scanner, but most of them are going to give you the option of capturing both a preoperative and a postoperative. So I would suggest that you do that. Uh, let's see. I want to start a new scan. All right, so it is ready, and it starts out on the upper. So this would be uh, something that we're doing maybe after you've numbed the patient up and are waiting for anesthesia to kick in. Uh, you can go ahead and knock out the majority of your scanning during that dead time so that once you prep, you can really just image one tooth and hopefully have a finalized model. Right, so I'm just going to look at any of these scan warnings. <clears throat> That's good enough. Push the button to switch jaws. Now we're going to do the opposing. And I don't think I said it, but this is going to be a crown on tooth number uh, three, so the upper right maxillary molar. All right. And now also go ahead and get your bite preoperatively. In fact, this is better to do before the patient gets numb as a rock and as their jaws sore from being open for so long. You want to capture this early on in the process so that hopefully their jaw gets out of back later on, it's not going to alter the uh, occlusion of your restoration. So we're done with the preoperative scan. All right, so now we have the opportunity to do our postoperative scan. So for this one, I'm only going to be doing the upper, and I want to take this cut tool, and I just want to cut that tooth out that has been prepped. So again, this is one of the nice things about doing your imaging on the front end before uh, you know finalizing your prep is that now you can not have to do the entire imaging process over again. You can just cut out that individual tooth and then just image that. It'll be far faster, get the patient out of the chair quicker. Okay, so that's all for the scanning. Click next. Okay, so here you can see the pre and the post-op. Um, I believe the prep reduction requirement for these materials, in this case, this is the Bigo Barceo crown. I believe it's one millimeter axial and one and a half occlusally. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I believe that's the case. So we're done with our imaging. You could mark your margin, although there's no point in me really doing that since I'm about to mark the margin in Blue Sky Plan. So we're just gonna save these scans. So now that we've got our scan done, we can go ahead and export these scans and we will take them into Blue Sky Plan. So I am going to create a new folder here real quick. Call it demo. And we'll export these. Now while that's exporting, we can go ahead and launch Blue Sky Plan. And again, this will be your opening screen. And in this case, we're just doing a simple crown. So we're going to click on crown and bridge. This is going to be a conventional crown. And now we'll go under this folder demo that I just created. It'll be a little easier to see if I get into this view. Okay, so we got a bunch of scans here. Uh, we can go with the mandibular pre-scan the maxillary prep scan, and then we want the maxillary pre-scan as well, because I am going to use that to reference when I'm designing. Those really are the only three that we're going to need here. Uh, the rest of them, just don't worry about. 
Okay, so when you bring those files in, you're going to see that you first have to align everything. So the software needs to know what's up, what's down, uh, and you'll see that it's got kind of a global relation uh, relative to the little skull that's in your bottom left corner. And so there's multiple ways to align. I'm just going to choose uh, a partial model alignment, and I need to click on the maxillary arch or the mandibular, whichever one you want to do, and we will now continue to alignment. And then you're going to follow the prompts in the upper right of your screen. So it's going to first ask for a uh, lingual cusp of a molar and then an incisal edge of an anterior and then the buccal cusp of that molar. And now, as you can see here, everything is lined up with the skull down in the bottom uh, left. So we have the anterior teeth facing forward and uh, we're ready now to go ahead and continue. So here are our models, and we've got three models. If you look in your surfaces panel, you can toggle these on and off. The yellow is that preoperative model. We don't have to have that, but I think it's a beneficial thing to have it when you're designing your crown because you can look at it, uh, the, the tooth that you're designing, relative to their preoperative condition. And that may be helpful if they've got an odd bite or just for recreating the overall shape and feel of that tooth. And so the first thing that we're going to need to do is add a tooth. Now, I could do that here. We're in the model editing panel right now, as you see. But let's go ahead and jump over to the crown design module. And with that done, I can right click this lower model and uh, hide that for the moment. We just want to add the tooth. So go up here to the add tooth button. And you've got a lot of libraries available. Uh, you know, having planned a lot of these, I think the the appearance of these teeth is most similar to this Mitch Hurst flat anatomy library, although you could make any of them work. So I'm going to click one of those, and now I need to hold the shift button and left click once. That drops the tooth into place. Now to move it around, go to your tooth editing panel. If you don't see that tabbed over here, you would just go to panels, tooth editing and I want to choose manipulate model and now when I hover over that tooth you're gonna see that a widget pops up and now I can begin positioning this tooth so I want to get it in the approximate position based on the adjacent teeth and then I need to make this a bit narrower and here I can't see the node that I need to grab on this so if you right click this model you can turn the transparency on and now you'll be able to see all the parts of that widget below. So I want to size the contact to where it's slightly impinging into the adjacent, as you can see right there, but not too much, just a little bit of impingement. And the software later on in the steps is going to cut away any of the uh, impingement areas so that you have a good contact. And now I just want to look at this from all different directions. Now, one of the first directions I look from is straight on either mesial or distal. Because here you can see that this uh, buccal cusps are kicked out from where their, um, their adjacent teeth are. So I can tilt that a bit. And at any point, if you want to bodily move the tooth, instead of using these arrows, just grab the tooth itself. And so as I do that, I'm looking and it looks like the central uh, groove height is about the same as the adjacent teeth. The angulation of the cusps is the same. And now I can look at it from the more occlusal uh, angle. Try to get it centered in between the teeth. Again, making sure that you've got a little bit of contact between the adjacents. And then we need to scale it buccal-lingually. Now, you could just eyeball that, or this is, again, nice to uh, have that preoperative tooth. So let's turn that on for a moment. And now when I look at this, I can see that that tooth is a bit uh, large in a buccal-lingual direction, and I can scale it down slightly. And this is going to make, make the patient feel like it's their original tooth, right? It's not going to feel like some giant uh, foreign object in their mouth. So I like the overall size here. If we wanted to further uh, try to match this tooth, then we can now do that by going uh, up and down, trying to get that central groove height the same. Pull this over just slightly. All right, that's looking pretty close. And I can turn that off now. Now, if you wanted to see uh, the intensity of the occlusion on this, 
that's what this box here is that says closeness. So if I wanted to see the closeness or the proximity of this tooth relative to its opposing, I uh, believe that is, yeah, that's the green model, then I can turn on closeness there. And as you can see now, I'm not seeing any kind of, uh, you know, interferences or anything. I could scoot this up and you're going to see that now that uh, becomes evident that there's too uh, much contact between the opposing. Control Z that. I think overall this is looking pretty good. I could stand to maybe come up ever so slightly with it. And once again, just looking at these cusps, maybe come down just a bit. So I'm seeing a little bit of pink in there. That's pretty ideal. Uh, this is a type of case. So again, occlusion is not quite as um, accurate as it would be on a, on a live patient case. But this looks great. I think now that we are ready to go ahead and design the crown. So uh, if you needed to, and I'll just show this real quick, you've got all of these little widgets that you can use to further modify it. For example, if I felt like uh, this cusp was too tall, I could hover on this and pull that down, right? Or here, you've got that. Let's control Z those changes. You've got just generic add and remove tools and you can affect the spot size. So here I'm adding height to the central groove. And once again, I'll just undo that. And finally, you've got the smooth function. So if you feel like anything is excessively rough or too much anatomy, then we could modify that with the smoothing tool. But this looks great. There's no um, impingement into the opposing. So now I'm ready to begin the crown. So in your restoration design panel, it'll either be tabbed here or you can go to panels, restoration design. I need to tell it what type of restoration I'm doing. This is a conventional crown. It's on the maxilla. And then we just have to define what the models are that we're building this crown on. So the model that we're building the crown on is that blue one. The crown that we're using in a case where you know you had multiple teeth in there you would have to designate which of these you're turning into the crown and then finally our antagonist if we want to indicate that and i would because that's going to allow you to dial in the occlusion and then simply push start and it will take you through this wizard so there's six steps and the first one is to uh, draw in the margin line now i don't need this tooth visible for this step i'm just going to zoom in really closely here and while holding the shift button, I will drop left clicks right on the margin and be as accurate with this step as you can be because this is obviously going to really affect the overall fit of your restoration if you get off on this. And for me, it's easiest to see this when I look at it, you know, at about a 45 degree angle or so. If at any point I drop a, an errant point like that, I can always grab that node and while holding shift, I can pull it back into the right position. Now let's spin it and look from this side and we'll just work our way around until we get back to where we started that margin. That one needs to come down just a bit. And then you want to drag the last node into the first so that you close this contour. So that looks like a very good margin. Look it over really closely again because this is super important that you get that right. And then we can click next. Now this is indicating the path of draw or the insertion axis for your crown. So it looks like just at the default uh, that the software came up with, I've got just a tiny bit of an undercut. You could proceed with this and that won't really make a difference. But if you wanted to alter it from where it is, you can either grab the um, ring here and twist it. Or what I prefer to do is just to look from above. And what I'm trying to do is I want to see basically all of the margin, obviously. I want to see as much of the axial walls as possible. And then I don't want to be looking way deep into this contact and not see this one. I want to angle it such that I'm looking straight down into the space and then you can hit set insertion direction from this view. And with that done, you see I have no undercuts at all now and I'm going to click next and go to the next step. 
Next step is to define your proximal area. So this is important in the final stages of fabrication where the software will subtract away any of those areas where your contact is impinging. So just hold the shift button, draw that in for both of your contacts. If, you know, if this was a second molar and there's nothing behind it, then just do the mesial one. And you can skip this step altogether. Again, it's just going to potentially leave a bit of impingement that you'll have to adjust if you don't do it. So we'll click next again. And this step is going to design the crown bottom or the internal of that crown. Now, if you were going to mill this crown, then you probably want to go with the defaults, which is a 0.1 cement spacer. There's going to be a one millimeter area from the margin, this indicated in green, where there's absolutely no cement gap. Um, and I would just go with exactly what the defaults are. However, for this uh, circumstance, I'm going to do a printed crown out of the Bigo permanent resin. And so when you're going to do a printed crown, you need a larger cement spacer. I would bump this up to, and it will depend on your printer, but I'm using a really, really accurate printer for this. I'm gonna go with a 0.15 uh, crown cement spacer, and I need to reduce the amount of uh, no cement gap. I'm gonna take this way down to maybe 0.1. Um, again, this is uh, the difference in milling versus printing. Printing is inherently going to be a little less accurate, so you need to build in slightly bigger tolerances. Plus, with this Bigo Permanent Crown Resin, you're going to be bonding this in, and so it's not as important as if you were, say, cementing it with just conventional cement. Everything else looks good. Um, you can alter your minimal thickness here if you want, uh, like if we wanted to make sure that there's no areas of less than, uh, you know, 0.6, then we can bump that up. And now you see that cement or uh, that minimal thickness has grown a bit. And now I'll click next. And even bumping it up like that, there's no areas where I have uh, any of that minimum thickness shining through. So everything's good. You've got the opportunity at this step to go ahead and alter your tooth. In fact, some people don't even really uh, position a tooth until this step. I like to do it on the front end though. So you could smooth, you could drag it a little more. You know, if this was um, not lining up somewhere, I could use the smooth tool and I could pull this back or the add remove. But you do have the opportunity here to make changes and I'm happy with that, so we'll click Next. And this is going to merge the inner part of the crown and the outer part of the crown. All right, now you see that you can see the crown is uh, adapted itself to the margin. Um, everything looks great here. And so the last step is basically just clicking your final OK. And I would suggest that you do both of these check boxes. This is to cut the occlusal intersections. Again, if I turn on that transparency, uh, notice right now that red area of impingement. If I don't cut away that intersection, then I'm going to end up having to adjust that to get it in the mouth, which I don't want to do. And same applies for the uh, occlusal interferences. Now, I know I don't have any here, but nonetheless, I'm going to always check that. So clicking this final button is going to finalize the crown. And now we have our completed restoration. And this is ready to be printed or milled. Uh, if you are going to mill your crown, if you have an in-house mill, this will export with the construction data. Uh, again, in my circumstance, I'm just going to end up printing this, but you can see we've got plenty of thickness. You can see right here that cement spacer that's built in of 0.15. So now I just need to export this. So file, export data. And as you see here, anything that I had visible on this 3D window is going to default as checked on to be exported. I don't want to export the model here. I only want to export that crown, the new crown. And it, you'll know it's the final as opposed to the initial placement based on this D and it'll say custom crown. Um, if you wanted to export it with the construction data for your cam in the mill, then you could check this on. I don't need that here. 
Um, I can choose uh, what file format. So we're just going to do a simple STL export. Now choose your folder that you want to save this in, name it, and we are now done with the crown design. So a very, very quick and easy process. Uh, I wasn't watching, but that may have taken five minutes. And so at this point, the last thing that I need to do is to fabricate this crown. So I'm going to launch my Rayware software. Uh, I've printed this Bego resin uh, mainly on two printers, the uh, Form Labs Form 3B and then also the Sprint Ray Pro. Uh, I have the Pro 95 and the Pro 55. The Pro 55 is the more accurate of the two, so I'm going to set my printer uh, to that. You can see here that Bego resin is an option and you can print this in uh, you know, 50 micron layers or 100 micron layers. Let's go with the 100. Um, you know, I personally can't tell much of a difference uh, between them. The, the fit and everything is perfectly fine doing it on 100. But if time is not an issue, certainly you could do 50. It's not a big deal. So let's apply that. I'm going to bring in this crown now. And then we can position this crown. So we'll put it right in the middle of the build plate. For uh, the most expedient printing, I want to orient this so that it is as short as possible. Um, that looks pretty good. We just need to build supports under it now. And so I like to use this road with a high density and medium strength. That makes it really easy to remove the supports. Uh, you'll probably end up only with about four supports anyway. And so I'll hit generate supports. And now this is ready to be printed. So if I come over here to the printer, uh, you can see this is going to be 21 minutes to print this. Uh, so I'll now start the printing. And once it's done, we'll pick back up with how to process this and get it ready to deliver. Okay, so the print was done. That took about 21, 22 minutes. And now I've just taken the build plate off and I'm going to scrape this crown off. And that's it. So generally you should do the full wash cycle and everything. However, if you're trying to do this same day dentistry type thing, um, there's nothing wrong with just being aggressive and just going ahead and doing some serious scrubbing on it you can get the same thing accomplished in a really really brief time period I am going to clip off the supports so only four supports and those fall away and now I'm just going to really aggressively scrub this in particular the occlusion where there could be some pooling of material and the internal Internal probably is the most important. And let's really get that rinsed off very well. It's a good time if you uh, need to smooth up any of those uh, support spots. This is a good time to do it. So... Zoom in here. You'll always have a little bit of a rough spot there where the, uh, the support comes off. You can look at your proximal contact and difficult to make out on the video, but right there you can kind of see in the light that is your contact. I don't want to alter that at all. In fact, one thing that you can do is you can take a pencil and just actually pencil in the exact area where that contact is so that you do not end up changing that. Because remember, that's a dead zero. But we can taper around that so that this is going to have a good smooth seating. Uh, 
All right, and then wipe it off one more time. Make really good and sure that this is clean. And now this is ready to go into the oven. So we'll put this into the oven and then I'll show you the final processing. Okay, we've completed the uh, curing cycle and we've got a nearly finished crown. And I don't know how well you can see this on the video, but there's always going to be a bit of a frosted appearance to these. And what that is, is the filler particles. Remember this being a permanent resin, it's highly filled. And uh, there's always going to be some filler particles that are exposed at the surface, giving it that frosty matte appearance. And so we need to remove those. It's recommended to use a sandblaster. So this is just a really cheap job off of eBay, about 20 bucks. And I'm using aluminum, oxi aluminum oxide. And now I'm just going to blast this and get rid of all of that frosty appearance. Um, both inside and out and this is not only going to help it look better but it's also going to add to the uh, polishability and the bonding strength um, once you go to bond this okay so sandblasting is done and now we just need to polish now the internal I'm not going to do anything to it other than just uh, you know, dry it out and make sure that there's no particles. And now I'm going to run over to my uh, benchtop lathe and give this a quick polish. Okay, last step again. Hopefully, you can see here that we've got this matte finish on the crown. So now I'm going to turn on the lathe. And this is just some polishing compound like you would use for a denture or any kind of a acrylic appliance. And now I'm just going to go over this lightly. You don't want to get real aggressive with it and then end up altering your contact and changing anatomy. I'm just barely applying any pressure to this. And I would suggest that the wheel is turning this way, so polish down towards your margin. Don't polish against your margin because you might end up um, altering the fit. So I'm doing all the axial walls of this crown. And that's what you got to be careful of. It's not supposed to happen when you're videoing and doing a demo. But I just sent that shooting across the room. And then on the occlusal, same thing. I use the corner of the wheel to really get into all the nooks and crannies. Another good way to do this, if you prefer it, is a Robinson bristle brush with some polishing compound in a slow speed hand piece, just a straight cone hand piece. Um, that does an excellent job as well. I just happen to have this right beside me at the moment. So now, you can see that this has got a nice luster to it. Great anatomy. Get all that polishing compound out of the grooves. Now, alternatively, some might choose to go ahead and just sandblast this and then bond it in and do your polishing intraorally. I would prefer to get that done before I put it in and then just be removing excess cement. So that's all of the polish. And let's just look at the fit now. So this was our original model. And we've got an excellent fitting restoration. Contacts are about perfect. As you can see, the margin is really well adapted. Oops. But the offsets that were used here, um, again, appear to be appropriate for the printer that I was using. If you have a, uh, you know, a slightly lower end printer, you might need to bump up that offset to something around 0.2, but Taking this tooth out, you can just see how tightly the margin adapts here. And I do need to polish off that compound a bit, but overall this is an excellent result. And I'm not gonna bother bonding this since it's on a Typodont, but if you wanted to see an example of one that is bonded, this is also a Bego restoration right here. This is in shade A3, I believe, but excellent anatomy.
And once you bond this, the margins just disappear. So really great fit to these. So that's really the entirety of that procedure, all the way from scanning to prepping, uh, to design, print, and then polish, everything except the bonding process. So hope you found that helpful, but this is a material I've been using for a while now and found uh, to have great results with, and uh, really has held up well in the mouth. You know, I'm, I've not been doing these myself. I've been doing them for other people uh, going on six, eight months now, and uh, I've had no breakage to this point. I've even been using these off-label in full arch hybrids. Uh, with excellent results. So great material. Hope you found that useful.